Nosweth da, a Chriso Canis Yown, a Digwithiad Hano. Good evening and a very warm welcome to this evening's event. My name is Sally McInnes. I'm Head of Unique Collections and Collections Care at the Library, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Moore was born and raised in Canada and completed her first degree in history at Simon Fraser University. After five years in arts events management, she moved to the UK to undertake an MA in early modern history at Swansea University, which sparked her interest in Welsh history. An abridged version of her MA dissertation was published in the Welsh History Review. She then pursued doctoral studies at the University of Exeter with doctoral studentships from the Wellcome Trust and the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. She was awarded the Economic History Power Postdoctoral Fellowship, which she held at Cardiff University, and she joined the Centre for English Local History at the University of Leicester as a lecturer in 2018. Dr. Muir's research interests focus on the social and cultural history of sex, gender, poverty, medicine and the body in early modern 18th century and 19th century England and Wales, and she has published widely on these subjects. Now let me pass you over to Dr. Muir for her presentation, Lives in Crime, Exploring Welsh Social History Through the Court of Great Sessions. Thank you, Dr. Muir. Thank you. Shamai, Diochavar and Dod, thank you for, uh, for coming today. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm Dr. Angela Muir and I'm a lecturer in British Social and Cultural History at the University of Leicester. My research mainly focuses on different aspects of gender and deviance in Wales during the long 18th century. And I've recently published my first book, Deviant Maternity, Illegitimacy in Wales, circa 1680 to 1800, which is out with Routledge. What I'll be talking to you about today is what I consider to be one of the best but most underutilized sources for the social and cultural history of Wales prior to the 1830s, which are the jail files from the Court of Great Sessions. Anyone who's worked with these records before will know how rich they are, but as they're only accessible at the National Library of Wales, not everyone will be aware of their existence, nor will they have ready access to them. So today, I'm going to introduce you to these records and then talk about some of the rich and fascinating evidence they reveal about life in Wales in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Now, there may be people listening now who are already familiar with these records, but I'm guessing there are gonna be more who aren't. So I'm going to start with a basic introduction to the jail files before moving on. The Court of Great Sessions was the highest court in Wales between the 1540s, when Wales was officially brought under the English legal system, and 1830, when the Great Sessions were abolished and replaced with the Assizes. During the period of their existence, the Great Sessions administered English law and oversaw both civil and serious criminal matters, which is one of the ways that they differed from the English Assizes. The jail files are the set of records relating to criminal proceedings from the court, which did operate similar to the Assizes. Welsh counties were organized into different circuits and the court met twice per year in each county. Records from each sitting or session, including pre-trial evidence such as witness statements and coroner's inquests, um, and trial records such as indictments and jury lists were bound together in a single file or bundle. And these are often wrapped in a large vellum, vellum document and they're now stored in this original format at the National Library. And they've not been digitized and are filed according to reference numbers that apply to the entirety of the bundle. Now, a basic digital index was created about 20 years ago, which is available online as the National Library of Wales Crime and Punishment Database. This is a searchable index where you can look up individuals, crimes and locations and find references to the files in which these cases are located. It's by no means comparable to the Old Bailey online project, but it is useful nonetheless as it's, it's detailed for an index and is the only way of accessing the details relating to specific cases between 1730 and 1830 without actually going to Aberystwyth and searching through the files themselves. Now, what makes the jail files unique compared to the English counterparts is the tremendous survival of pre-trial documents. So, depositions, witness examinations, and confessions, which were drawn up after a crime had been reported, but before formal prosecution and trial. So pre-trial records in Wales survived in such great number because the official language of the court during this period 
was, was English, but the majority of the population spoke Welsh. So the evidence provided under oath shortly before a crime or shortly after a crime had been discovered, but before the trial was central to the criminal trial process. These records contain an abundance of detail that often goes well beyond the evidence of crime and in many ways is unmatched in Britain. Although often translated and seldom verbatim, the details given convey the actions and experiences of witnesses, victims and suspects. Not only do jail file records provide insight into crime and deviance, they also provide unique glimpses into people's identities, status, circumstances, beliefs, values and relationships, as well as social interactions, including conflicts and negotiations. So these records are not only rich sources of evidence about crime, they also provide fascinating insight into the hidden everyday lives and experiences of individuals who often left no records of their own. Most interesting to me, it's in these records that we find the voices and experiences of marginalized individuals who we often don't find in other records. So paupers, men and women from the laboring classes, sex workers, individuals who engaged in sexual practices that were deemed criminal or deviant, as well as religious and ethnic minorities such as Jewish people and individuals identified as gypsies. We often don't associate with Wales in earlier centuries. And these are people who encountered the legal system as witnesses, victims or defendants. And it's not that they were more prone to criminal behaviors, but that the details in these sources makes visible what's often obscured in other official records. This detail allows researchers to examine an enormous, enormous range of previously hidden experiences. And many of the most interesting details are often peripheral to criminal activities. So although this talk is, um, in this talk, I explore records relating to the criminal justice system in Wales, and although I'll discuss a wide range of criminal cases, my focus today is instead on the social and the cultural and not the criminal. And I should say, I'm not the first historian to use court records as a way of exploring something beyond crime and the law. Natalie Zeman Davis pioneered the use of legal records as cultural artifacts back in the 1980s, and many historians have followed her lead ever since. And I'm also not the first historian of Wales to study the jail files. However, very few historians have used Welsh records in this particular way, although I'm confident that all of the historians who have used the jail files for histories of crime are aware of their immense potential. So what I'm going to do now is walk you through evidence from seven different court cases that I find particularly fascinating. And in discussing the crimes, I'll unpick some of the details that shed light on these often hidden parts of Welsh history ranging from courtship customs to neighborliness and conflicts to folk customs to minority groups that we often don't associate with histories of Wales. And I'm going to start with three cases from Wales in the 18th and early 19th centuries that reveal how some Welsh people courted during this period. All of these cases involve men and women who weren't married or weren't married to each other, engaging in, or at least attempting to engage in premarital sex with at least some intention or perceived intention of marrying. Now, spoiler alert, because these are court records, none of these cases end well. So in 1799, a young servant woman from Anglesey named Elizabeth Owen was brought before the magistrates accused of skulking, uh, about the parish of Llanfailog and violently suspected of maliciously and feloniously setting fire to a haystack, two corn stacks, a cart house and its contents, which were the property of a young widow named Ellen Owen, who lived in a place called Pensairi in the parish of Llanfailog. And it's worth bearing in mind that this is a rural, relatively remote part of Anglesey scattered with farms. This case is interesting because women aren't often associated with violent property crimes such as arson, but several witnesses apparently had good reason to suspect that Elizabeth had set this fire. Some of the people who lived in properties nearby stated that they saw or encountered a woman who looked and sounded like Elizabeth Owen. Um, and around, uh, around four o'clock in the afternoon on the day in question, a man named Owen Williams deposed that the accused, who he didn't know at the time, came to his door and asked him how far it was to Pensiri. Owen and his wife told the woman that the property was about three quarters of a mile away. And they also stated that this woman was wearing a blue cloak, a beaver hat, and a spotted shawl with a handkerchief about her head. Owen then deposed that about three hours later, the same person passed by his house again with a hood pulled over her head. He bid the woman good night, and she replied with the same. 
Another witness named John David, who did know the accused, said he saw her walking in the general direction of the property in question, but they didn't exchange any words. But he confirmed that Elizabeth was wearing a blue cloak, a beaver hat, and a spotted shawl. A further witness, John Williams, deposed that at dusk on the evening in question, he saw that the corn stack was on fire and asked a woman that he met about 100 yards away from the fire going rather hastily between walking and running what the cause of the fire was, to which she replied she didn't know. Although John didn't know the woman, after hearing the voice of Elizabeth, he was convinced it was the same woman he had passed that evening. A witness named William Chaber Chambers, who helped to extinguish the fire, asked around and was told by several others that a strange woman was observed in the neighborhood and that the cart house and the corn stacks were about 20 to 30 yards apart. So it would appear that the two fires were set separately and intentionally, rather than spreading naturally between the two. A woman named Ellen Jones also provided a witness deposition. She and her husband lived about a field's distance from Pensiri, and she said that on the night in question, a woman who matched the description of Elizabeth Owen came to her house and asked for some fire in a wisp of straw, which she had, which she had brought in her hand. Ellen asked the woman where she lived, to which this woman replied, at no great distance. And so Ellen gave her a piece of turf with some fire in it. It was about 10 minutes after this that the fire was discovered. As an aside, this last detail provides some interesting information about day-to-day -day life in earlier centuries. Fire, of course, was central to cooking and heating, but items such as matches and lighters wouldn't have been readily available. In addition to providing evidence in a criminal case, this interaction shows us some of the ways in which individuals could and did turn to each other for help with basic necessities such as fire. And the practicalities of these exchanges, like using straw or turf to transport a flame from one hearth to another. Now, going back to the case, we have two fires that appear to have been set deliberately to one person's property. In the lead up to these fires, several witnesses see the same strange woman in the area, and the same woman asks for and is provided with fire a short time before the maliciously set fire breaks out. Elizabeth was questioned and accounted for her whereabouts on the day by saying that she had asked her master, Humphrey Williams, for permission to leave to go see her cousin. The property where Elizabeth lived and worked as a servant was in the parish of Saint-Tricent, which was approximately eight miles away from Pensiri, so potentially about two and a half to three hours away by foot. She said that she stayed at her cousin's for about an hour and then set out walking for another two hours in the general direction of, but nowhere actually near, Pensiri. When it started to get dark, she claimed that she begged for lodging in someone's home and she was welcomed in and allowed to bunk in with their servants. And this practice of taking in a lodger for the night when they're stranded at dusk was relatively common. Humphrey Williams was Elizabeth's master and he was a yeoman far farmer. And what this means is that he was a farmer who owned the property that he farmed. Now this isn't really a measure of wealth because you could be a yeoman with a relatively small plot of land or a very large one. So there's significant variation um, in what this term covers. The documents that we have relating to this don't really reveal too much, but it's probable that Humphrey was around the lower to middle part of this spectrum. Now Humphrey was examined by the court and deposed that Elizabeth had asked him for leave to visit her cousin around a quarter past one in the afternoon on the day of the fire and stated that she didn't return until the following morning. He also deposed that she had been wearing a blue cloak, a beaver hat and a kerchief. So we have a crime, we have a suspect, we have opportunity, we have witnesses, but what we don't have is motive. And this is where it gets really interesting. Ellen Owen, the woman whose property was set alight, stated in her complaint that she had just cause to suspect Elizabeth Owen of voluntarily and maliciously setting fire to her property. But her statement doesn't reveal why she suspected this. However, two other documents do provide a glimpse of what Elizabeth's motives might have been. Uh, Mary Jones, a fellow servant in Elizabeth's and William's household, or Humphrey William's household, was examined and deposed that Elizabeth had told her that their master had been paying his addresses to Ellen Owen, which means that Humphrey was courting Ellen. And the evidence for this was that Humphrey was in possession of Ellen's garters. Now, Garters are a very personal item that even today we associate with certain marriage rituals. How Humphrey came into possession of Ellen's garters, we can't exactly know, but this does provide us with a glimpse into Welsh and British in general courtship practices. 
We know from other studies that one of the central features of courtship in the past was the exchange of gifts. And this was part of the promise or statement of intentions and desire to get married. That garters, which are such a personal item were gifted suggests that there may have been a level of intimacy between Humphrey and Ellen as well. And I found through my own research into illegitimacy during this period that intimacy before marriage wasn't uncommon in Wales and couples often engaged in courtship practices that involved them spending an entire evening unsupervised together. And I don't think it takes much imagination to think of what might be going on that could lead a man coming into possession of the undergarments of the woman he's courting. So these few lines in a court document reveal quite a bit about certain cultural practices. But why would Elizabeth have cared that Humphrey was paying his addresses to Ellen? Well, according to Mary, Elizabeth had described Ellen as a mean person like herself, which means she thought that her and Ellen were of similar status, which was mean or relatively low. What this says in relation to Humphrey's status as a yeoman, we can't know, but this does suggest that Elizabeth saw herself as a potential contender. For his affections. And it wasn't uncommon for masters who weren't very far up the social order to marry their servants, often because their servants were young people from families similar in status to their own households. Um, and these servants were gaining experience in saving money before setting up their own households. And I'm afraid my PowerPoint got a life of its own and has done part of the reveal, which I'm getting to now. So did Elizabeth allegedly set these fires out of jealousy because she was a scorned party in a love triangle? Well, Evidence given by William Chambers, who helped put out the fires, sheds considerable light on this. William deposed that he had been told by others that Humphrey Williams was treating at marriage with Ellen Owen, which of course we know. But Mary Jones also deposed that she knew Elizabeth and Humphrey used to lay together. And William Chambers also said that Humphrey's servant Elizabeth was with child by Humphrey. So in addition to courting Ellen, he had some sort of sexual relationship with Elizabeth and it would appear that Elizabeth had understood their relationship to be one of courtship as well. So what we have here appears to be a case of jealous, scorned and a pregnant lover taking matters into her own hands and retaliating against what she saw as the problem. Now I've used this case before at open day lectures at the University of Leicester. And in those scenarios, I often survey, survey the audience to see what they, they think the outcome of this case was whether or not Elizabeth was found guilty or not guilty. And I won't do that here because of the nature of the setup, but what I will do is use the same reveal I use for those settings simply because I like it and I think it fits. So Elizabeth was found not guilty of arson. And this totally unprofessional reveal aside, what's fascinating about this case is that it's a legal record relating to a single instance of suspected arson but what it demonstrates are a range of social interactions and cultural practices which enrich our understanding of everyday life for men and women in this nation's past. And this is one of countless such records. Now I have two more cases relating to courtship that I'll share with you. And one of the reasons why I've looked into courtship customs in Welsh court records is that in part, it's because of these high levels of illegitimacy that I found through my own research. But it's also because there are certain certain customs that outsiders, mainly the English, have attributed to the Welsh, which there's very little first-hand evidence of. And these are rituals that have been portrayed as ancient folk customs written about by English writers traveling through the Welsh countryside. However, we also know that some of these writers never actually set foot in Wales and instead based their accounts on things that they had read or heard from others. So the veracity of these claims is questionable. Some similar descriptions of courtship customs were made by English officials in the 1830s who were interested in reforming dis different aspects of Welsh society and essentially making the Welsh more English. And they wrote about certain Welsh customs in really judgmental ways. But again, it's not clear if those who wrote about these customs had any firsthand knowledge of them. The courtship ritual that's most associated with Wales, which I imagine some of you may have heard of, is something called bundling. And this is where a young unmarried couple would sit up together at night. And this is a practice that we sometimes call cardi on a or cardi on nos or love in a bed or love at night. And this ritual is sometimes called bundling because the idea was you would bundle the woman into a blanket or a sack and stitch it up so that anything from the neck down was off limits. But we actually don't know how common that part of this was. Often courtship took place in the woman's home and would involve a young man sneaking into the woman's home, presumably with her consent, and spending the night. Her parents or master, if the young woman was a servant, would allow, her to, would allow it to take place 
by turning a blind eye to it. And this was something that was supposed to happen only in the later, more serious stages of courtship, um, when it was apparent that a couple would eventually get married. Now, with young men and women who are interested in each other spending the night together, unsupervised, we can only imagine what they were getting up to. So this is a ritual that the English writer, that English writers included in their descriptions of customs of the Welsh people, but is there any evidence of it that comes from the Welsh themselves? Well, yes, thanks to the Great Sessions. Now, the next case I'm going to talk to you about is from 1823 and is also from Anglesey. In April of that year, a labourer named Griffith Roberts was charged with burglary with intent. Several witnesses gave evidence in this case, including Griffith himself, and each deposition provides the same revealing narrative. According to records, Griffith had been drinking at a local pub until about one o'clock in the morning. Uh, after that, he walked to the home of a man named William Griffith, where he and a young woman named Jane Owen, uh, where a young woman named Jane, Jane Owen, sorry, worked as a servant. Once he reached the home, he took off all of his clothing except for his breeches, and he slid open a sash window and crawled inside. Griffith quickly learned that in his drunken stupor, he accidentally crawled through the window of the master of his, the house and his wife, rather than the window of his intended target. William awoke in a start and was able to restrain Griffith while the rest of the household awoke and contacted the local constable. Griffith was arrested and charged with burglary and, in his defense, said that he had been in the custom of courting Jane, the servant girl, and that his intentions was to crawl through the bedroom window into her bedroom window and not William's. Now, Jane also provided a witness statement. On the night in question, she was awakened by the shouting of another member of the household. She went to investigate and found her master restraining Griffith, who, at first, she said she didn't recognize. However, after a few moments, she realized it was Griffith Roberts who she said she had courted, um, they had courted about you know, three or so months previously. And that during this time, he had crawled through the window to see her, or she would let him in through the door when no one was looking and they would court in bed, which another servant corroborated. So it would appear that what we have here is a straightforward case of a former lover drunkenly seeking out the affections of his former paramour late one night. However, it's not that, that straightforward. Although both Griffith and Jane admitted to having a history of courting each other at night, Jane said that at the time, Griffith had told her that he was a single man and she accepted his advances. But, and this is a big but, it turns out that the whole time, Griffith was actually a married father of one. Being informed of this, Jane stopped seeing him. So Griffith was not in fact genuinely courting Jane and was instead committing fornication and adultery. Now we're all human, so I can imagine that we have an opinion about Griffith's actions, but as an academic historian, it's not my place to judge people in the past in the ways that we might judge people around us today. So what's interesting for a historian like me is not the scandalous detail of a man, a married man carrying out a nighttime affair with another woman, but the fact that Griffith was able to use a courtship custom as a defense for his breaking and entering in the first place. Had the practice of bundling not existed in this area, it would have made very little sense for him to try and justify his actions through this. So from this case, we can deduce that courting at night was likely a legitimate practice for young couples, at least in this area. And in this case, Griffith wasn't even indicted for the crime. Now we can also find evidence of this sort of custom in the records of other more serious crimes as well. And the next case I'd like to tell you about is unfortunately considerably more grim than the last one. And this is a case that comes to us from Carmarthenshire in 1816. It involves a 19 year old farmer's daughter named Elizabeth Jones and a young preacher and farmer named Reese Thomas Reese. Now Reese didn't provide any statement or if he did, it hasn't survived. But we do know from all the witness statements collected during the pretrial trial process that Reese had been paying his addresses to Elizabeth for approximately two years before she suddenly fell violently ill, was taken to bed and ultimately died several days later. In the time between when Elizabeth fell ill and when she died, she was able to tell her family about how she came to be so gravely ill. Elizabeth's mother, father, and sister all provided statements saying that they had known Reese relatively well because he had been visiting the household in the two years leading up to Elizabeth's death. 
During this time, they said that Reese had sat up with Elizabeth in the kitchen of the home, often all night long, for the purposes of courting her, as is customary in the country. During these visits, the young couple were likely left alone as Elizabeth ultimately became pregnant. When she found this out, she informed Reese as well as her family, and presumably she thought that this revelation would prompt Reese to propose marriage. We don't know how her family reacted to the news, but we do know that Reese was not exactly excited about the prospects. Instead, he decided to take matters into his own hands and remedy the situation in a pretty terrible way. A few days after hearing the news, Reese paid a visit to a local surgeon named Joseph Yeomans. Joseph provided Reese with a gray liquid that was likely a mixture of arsenic, mercury, and other toxic substances that were believed to induce a miscarriage. On the night in question, Elizabeth's father said he and the rest of the family went to bed around 10 o'clock at night, leaving Elizabeth and Reese alone in the kitchen of the home. According to her deathbed confession, Reese spent at least an hour trying to convince Elizabeth to consume the liquid. And finally, she gave in and drank it, fearing that if she did not, he would force it upon her. Immediately after consuming the substance, Elizabeth said she felt a searing heat, uh, like a flame of fire in her throat and in her chest, and cried out that she knew he had given her something that would kill her. Reese then fled the house, taking the empty bottle with him. Shortly after, Elizabeth's sister Gwen found her face down on the floor in a pool of sick and blood and called out for their parents. They lifted her off the floor and helped her to bed where she remained until she died. On her deathbed, Elizabeth also told her parents that she had neither finger nor fault in her own death and that it was the substance that Reese Thomas Reese had given her that caused her to be ill. She also told them that after learning about her pregnancy, Reese attempted on at least two other occasions to persuade Elizabeth to consume a bottle of liquid, which she refused to do. Apparently, Reese told her that this substance was for purging the blood, which, as an aside, tells us a bit about medical understandings and practices in this part of Wales, at least at this time. So the idea of purging the blood, which we also see in practices like bloodletting, comes from the ancient understanding of the body called the humoral system, which was all about finding a balance in the body's fluids. And this, understa this understanding was very much in decline by the 19th century, but persisted in many areas, including Wales. And we see that in this description of the alleged curative properties of this, of this substance. Now, anyway, when Reese asked if Elizabeth had taken the substance, she said yes, but of course she hadn't taken it at all. Astonished that she seemed so unaffected, he allegedly visited Joseph Yeomans again, and this time asked for a stronger mixture, which is ultimately the drink that Elizabeth consumed. Before drinking the po poison, Elizabeth asked if it would make her ill enough to require a doctor, and Reese assured her that if she needed a doctor, he would provide her one. True to his word, after hearing how ill she was, but before Elizabeth revealed to her parents what had happened, Reese again hired the services of Joseph Yeomans, who attended to Elizabeth and determined that she had a bout of colic and quinsy, or tonsillitis, and gave her a spoonful of another substance in the small bottle with instructions to take it every two hours. And we don't know what this was, but apparently her parents didn't administer it to her, administer it to her as instructed, likely because they were skeptical about this doctor and his connection to Reese. The family later decided to hire another surgeon who instructed her family to give her as much milk as she could drink and provided a few topical remedies, but to no avail. Elizabeth's father stated that in the week prior to her falling ill, his daughter had told her, told him she was pregnant. After she got sick, he called Reese to the house and asked if he had seduced his daughter, which he said he had not. He then asked Reese if he had given his daughter any liquid that would cause her illness, which Reese denied. Her father then said that if he had, he would see him hanged for it because she had taken ill. An acquaintance of both Reese and Elizabeth also provided evidence, saying that after Elizabeth fell ill, Reese came to him in a very worried state and stated that although Reese did not confess to anything, he repeatedly said that he had not intended to cause harm to anyone. A neighbor named Gwen also provided evidence saying that she had visited Elizabeth daily during her illness and on one occasion witnessed her having a fit. When she revived from the fit, Elizabeth asked for her sister to be called for. And when she arrived, Elizabeth said to her, take warning at her situation and said nothing more. After languishing for eight days, Elizabeth succumbed to the effects of the poison and died. Reese was charged with murder and at trial was convicted and sentenced to death, just as Elizabeth's father had promised. 
And although this is a horrible and very far from romantic case, which contains some rather graphic descriptions of the damage the poison did to Elizabeth's body, which I won't go into, it does still provide historians with evidence about the types of courtship activities young Welsh couples engaged in. From both of these last two cases, we know that some young couples did spend the night together, and this appears to be generally accepted by families under the right circumstances. This could involve a man sneaking into a bedroom through a window or could involve a man being invited to sit in a less intimate space, such as a kitchen, but then being left without supervision. Under either of these circumstances, a young couple had an opportunity to be intimate if they wanted, although it would appear that this was not necessarily encouraged. The expectation was that courting couples would actually marry, so any child conceived would be born inside marriage, just perhaps less than nine months after the wedding. But these more mundane instances where couples did actually marry haven't ended up in any written historical records as this was likely a routine occurrence and few people would have documented it. The reason that these two cases ended up in court wasn't because of the courtship practice itself, but because the practice didn't follow the unwritten social rules. By looking at these relatively rare cases where it went wrong, we can understand what likely happened in the countless other situations where it went to plan. Now, Moving away from courtship, I have a couple of cases that reveal the complicated nuances and details of neighborly relations, both of which come from homicide cases. This, this next case is from Cardigan in 1788 and involves a widow named Elizabeth George who was known in her community to have previously run a body house. In July of that year, Two men, Samuel Mann and Ephraim Wells, a brickmaker and bricklayer from Cheltenham, entered the Black Lion pub in Cardigan, which still exists today. They asked the landlord, John Mason, where they could find a girl, to which Mason replied he didn't know. Mann and Wells then asked where old Bessie was, to which Mason replied she was very sick and had been for some time. Not taking no for an answer, Mann and Wells helped themselves to a bottle of brandy and left. Mason followed the pair in secret to the house of Elizabeth George. Mason deposed that he heard a commotion coming from the house, including the men offering her money and Elizabeth crying out to be left alone, followed by the sounds of chairs and benches being moved around. When Mason heard Elizabeth cry out in Welsh, for God's sake, let me alone, he threw a stone at the house and then went away. A married woman named Sarah who lived next door to Elizabeth deposed that Elizabeth had an asthmatic complaint or a dropsy in her chest and in her stomach for a long and tedious time. Over the preceding months, Sarah had tended to her and helped her to bed each night by propping a bench against the wall and attaching her clothing to the wall to keep Elizabeth upright so she could breathe through the night. On the evening when Mountain Wells forced their way in, Sarah had already been by to do this and then retired to bed herself along with her husband. Later that night, they were awakened by a noise in Elizabeth's house and Sarah urged her husband to go and investigate. He went to do so, but because of her reputation as a person who kept a body house frequented by loud persons of both sexes and because the noise soon stopped, Sarah's husband never actually investigated or intervened. Early the following morning, Sarah went to see how Elizabeth was and she found the door open and Elizabeth dead on the bed in an indecent manner with her lower body exposed. Elizabeth was deemed to have died of an asthma attack. Wells and Mann both fled, avoiding prosecution. And this case is fascinating because it reveals the complex and at time conflicted status of women who, in, who engaged in sex work. It's worth noting that prostitution itself was not and is not illegal in Britain. What was illegal at the time was operating a disorderly house, so an unregulated, unlicensed establishment that operated in such a way that it disrupted the peace, which could include body houses or spaces where casual or solicited sex took place, but it was the disruption that was the issue and not the inappropriate sexual contact. Elizabeth, Elizabeth's reputation as the owner of a body house was clearly known in the community, but that did not prevent her from being on the receiving end of charity and care from her neighbors. Sarah tended to her each night and the pub landlord attempted to a limited degree to dissuade her assailants from going to her. However, their, intention, their interventions were limited. We can't know why the pub landlord threw a stone and ran away rather than intervene or seek help, but 
with regards to Elizabeth's neighbor, it's clear from the husband's testimony that despite her ill health and compromised physical position, he declined to intervene because of her reputation as a sex worker. It's impossible to know if there are any deep rooted moral judgments at play, but at least on the surface, it seems as though it was not only Elizabeth's ill health that made her vulnerable, it was also her reputation, which prevented any meaningful intervention on her behalf. Now, very little research has been done on sex work in Wales in earlier centuries, and that's in large part because there's so little evidence of it, especially compared to other places in Britain, such as London. Sex work in Wales is the focus of my current research project, so there's plenty more I could say about this, but I won't right now. But for now, I think the interesting takeaway point is um, there's clear evidence in Wales of it if you know where to look for it. Um, and it's the status of sex workers in communities was likely far more complex um, and complicated than we may assume. Now, the complex nature of neighborly relations, especially among women, is also apparent in the final murder case that I'll, I'll share with you. And this is in the parish of Llewell in Breckenshire in 1730. Um, a woman named Elizabeth Roberts gave evidence relating to a charge of murder. Elizabeth was the wife of Thomas Roberts Esquire and gentleman. These are the highest status individuals I'll be discussing today. According to Elizabeth's examination on the 30th of April, 1730, which was a Sunday, Elizabeth's husband stood in the doorway of their home, distributing charitable money to the poor of the parish. A local pauper named Jeanetta Reese arrived to collect some of this money, but came too late as all of the money had been uh, distributed by the time she arrived. Not satisfied with this, Elizabeth stated that Jeanetta began to verbally abuse her as she stood in the door of her home, uh, giving her what she described as fearsome and opprobrious language, which Elizabeth claimed provoked her to fetch a chamber pot from within the house and throw the contents of it upon the clothes of Janetta. And as you can imagine, this further provoked Janetta, who then ran violently towards Elizabeth and endeavored to take the chamber, chamber pot from her hands, but in so doing, dropped it on the ground where it broke into pieces. Janetta uh, picked up one of the broken shards of chamber pot and threw it at Elizabeth, but unfortunately Janetta missed her target and struck a bystander named Mary Powell in the head, and unfortunately this blow was fatal. Now this is really all of the detail we have in this case, which isn't very much, but it's still revealing. Many aspects of this case fit with existing studies of women and violence in Britain at this time, although much of this research has focused on, on England, especially London. You know, if women fell into altercations, they, these typically took place near their own homes, and if weapons were involved, they were usually objects that they had to hand, including chamber pots. So the MO of this crime isn't very surprising. But what is noteworthy is who was involved in this. This was an altercation between two women at different ends of the social spectrum, a pauper and a member of the gentry, which is unusual. What's even more unusual is that the woman of the higher status is the one who escalated the conflict from verbal to physical violence in a pretty grotesque way. A gentlewoman emptying the contents of a chamber pot onto a pauper woman who is hurling verbal abuse at her seems exceptional indeed. And I don't think this is evidence of the brutality or incivility of the Welsh because arguments like that are problematic on so many levels. But what I do think this is evidence of is the nature of social life and dynamics in small Welsh communities at the time. In smaller rural parishes in Wales, the day-to-day -day dynamics of social hierarchies would have been less pronounced. And many inhabitants lived in relatively close proximity to one another. So there were fewer barriers between the rich and the poor. So what we have here is an exceptional circumstance where tensions mounted and boiled over with tragic consequences. And I think this case serves to demonstrate that if we want to understand the nuances of Welsh social life in the past, we need to pay close attention to when things went wrong. And the Great Sessions provide excellent access to this. And I think this also demonstrates that although under the same legal system as England, the context of crime deviance in society in Wales needs to be considered in its own right. Now, I have two other cases that I want to briefly mention because they reveal the richness of detail and diversity that we can find in these records and the potential for future research. This first one is from Glamorgan in the 1780s, and for the most part is a relatively straightforward case of assault with attempt to rob. In this case, a peddler was walking along the turnpike road between Bridgend and Margam when a man named Thomas David approached him and asked him what he was selling. 
The peddler replied, nothing, because it's a Sunday. Thomas David then attempted to take the peddler's watch out of his pocket, but the peddler managed to escape over a turnstile. However, Thomas David caught the peddler's pack and pulled him back over, and then he took a stick and hit the peddler over the head. The peddler hollered out until people, people came to his assistance, and Thomas David made his escape. However, the men who came to the peddler's assist, assistance went after Thomas, found him concealed, and brought him before the magistrates. Thomas was found guilty and was transported to Africa for several years because this was during that brief window of the failed experiment of African transportation. Little about this case is out of the ordinary as this was a type of assault and robbery that was relatively common. But what is noteworthy is the identity of the peddler. The peddler's name was Benedict Moses and he was identified in these records as a traveling Jew. In their initial exchange on the turnpike Pike Road, when Thomas asked Benedict what he was selling, Benedict said nothing because it was a Sunday, the Christian Sabbath. Thomas then asked specifically if he was a Jew, and Benedict told him that he was. What's even more noteworthy is that Benedict signed his witness deposition in Hebrew. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I've consulted several people who are, and they've confirmed that this is indeed Hebrew. So here we have a Jewish peddler in South Wales in the 1780s. And it's impossible to know if this assault was motivated by anti-Semitism or just plain greed, but it is apparent that Benedict's religious and ethnic identity did mark him out in some way. His assailant commented on it, those who came to his rescue described him as a traveling Jew, and based on his elegant signature, Benedict's Judaism was clearly an important part, important part of his identity. The, ver the verdict of guilty and the sentence of transportation indicates that this assault was treated seriously by the courts. Now, we do know from the research of Kai Perry Jones that there were, were Welsh communities in Wales since at least the 1760s. And the earliest one was in Swansea, which is very close to where this assault took place. However, this was relatively small. This record provides us valuable evidence of one individual who was likely part of or connected to that earliest Jewish community in Wales. And this also serves as an important reminder that the history of Wales, even as early as the 18th century, is not just about the history of white people of Celtic, Anglo-Saxon or Norman descent living in relative isolation other than their actions, interactions with other white people east of Office Dyke. Wales was part of broader European and global networks, which means that there's far more diversity to be found in Wales's past than we typically find in existing histories. There are excellent histories of diverse groups in Wales, but these histories can and should be woven into the broader narrative of Welsh history. And I think the jail files provide an excellent opportunity for that. It's through these, these records that we can find evidence not only of Jewish people in Wales, but evidence of Romani people, uh, as well as further evidence of Wales's links to the transatlantic slave trade uh, running throughout everyday encounters. And to me, this is what the future of Welsh history should look like. Um, and then finally, given that we're slowly approaching what seems like the least festive Christmas season in recent memory, the final case I'll share with you is an example of a quintessentially Welsh Christmas tide ritual and an exceedingly grim case. And apologies in advance, some of the details I'm about to share are quite disturbing. Now, in February 1814, the body of a recently deceased newborn baby boy was found disposed of near the Turnpike Road in Neath. Suspicion fell on Rachel John of Llangevelloc, an unmarried woman who the month previously had called into the town of Neath, saying that she had temporarily left her service due to ill health. Margaret Lewis, the daughter of Neath's constable, gave evidence stating that Rachel had come to her home on the 4th of January and asked for a place to lodge for the night. Margaret said Rachel looked swollen and unwell, which Rachel said was due to a rheumatism and the layers of clothing she was wearing to keep, keep warm. Rachel spent the night and the next day she went to the town to meet members of the family she had been serving with and assist them at the market. That evening, the night of the 5th of January, she returned to Margaret Lewis's home saying that she had met the family that day but would need to stay another night because it was too late to return to Llangavelloc, which was approximately eight miles away. Just before Rachel went to bed that night, Margaret stated that it being old Christmas Eve, several people took to the streets soliciting money to drink dressed in strange and frightful garb. Rachel was apparently frightened by their appearance and extravagant merriment, which much disturbed and intimidated her, and so she retired to bed. The following morning, Margaret found Rachel in bed in great pain and sweating profusely. 
that night, Rachel allegedly snuck out of the house with a chamber pot and Margaret found a great deal of blood in the bed. Rachel was questioned about this as the household suspected she had delivered a child, but Rachel said she had only miscarried. Now, this is one of many grim cases of infanticide we have in the Great Sessions, the details of which can be quite harrowing and quite hard to read, but a revealing of the challenges and extreme lengths that some unmarried pregnant women went to. And this is something I've written about elsewhere, and it's not my purpose here to discuss those details. The reason I'm discussing this case is because the details about this extravagant merriment that took place the night Rachel allegedly miscarried um, and delivered are interesting. Many accounts of infanticide include details of an event that frightened the mother and compromised the health of the fetus. In this case, people gathering in the streets, going door to door, soliciting drink, dressed in frightful garb, certainly sounds like the Mary Lloyd, that Welsh folk ritual that takes place in early January, especially in South Wales, where revelers dress up the skull of a mare and go door to door, wassailing. Like bundling, many of the early accounts of the Mary Lloyd come from outside observers. However, what we have here is a passing first-hand reference to the nature of this ritual. It was clearly a festive and jovial community ritual, but was also evidently ruckus enough to be used as justification for a woman miscarrying. The small detail in an otherwise disturbing record provides us with a small uh, glimpse of yet another aspect of Welsh culture and society in the early 19th century. And it serves as yet another excellent example of how richly detailed the jail files are. Not only are they a superb source of evidence about crime in Wales, they are also one of the richest sources of evidence of the ordinary and the everyday in Wales' past. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Muir. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, really, really interesting and so much diversity within the collection. Um, how much more research are you going to do on this? Because it's a, it's a big collection. It's a huge collection. I mean, if I could, I mean, from where it stands now, if I could, I'd, I'd devote the rest of my professional life uh, to looking at it. I've been in talks with the library about some plans, but yeah, there's just, I, I, I'll do as much as I can, really. But I'd like to encourage other people to use them too, because I only have one way of looking at them. And I'm sure other people would, uh, would find other more interesting or different um, material in there as well. And just let's see, have we got any questions at all? Really interesting, thank you. Do you think that the case in relation to the owner of the body house is indicative of the fact that sex workers were not well dealt with justly in the court system at that time? As in, is there any evidence of prejudice seeping into the judgment sentence passed? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think there's evidence of attitudes towards the lower orders in general throughout the criminal justice system in Britain. So not necessarily just just sex workers, but large portions of marginalized communities simply because um, the criminal justice system was set up to, to protect those who had property. Um, and because those who have property are the ones who are, are um, overseeing the, the, the system. So there's, there's prejudice in that way where you see far more anxiety and charges against uh, the, the laboring poor. Um, but in terms of, of the body house, there's, Honestly, I only have two cases of body houses in Wales that have come up in the court records. Most other examples of, of prostitution that I've come across um, are casual solicitation in the street. Um, the only case I have where there's a guilty verdict is where there's several neighbors and even several customers coming forward saying it's like, this place is definitely a body house and it's disrupting the public. And it's right after a passing of the Disorderly Houses Act. Um, so it's not, I'm sure, I'm sure there's an element of stigma and judgment around women who were in, engaged in the sex trade, but it's all lumped into other elements of sort of class-based stigma. Okay, so just a quick question, can uh, someone want to say what a body house is exactly? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, a body house is a brothel, essentially. So another one, great talk. Do the indexes generally capture the names of deponents? Um, typically not, no. And that's one of the frustrating things. The, the index is quite limited. It also doesn't, you can't search it by say gender, or age or those sorts of things. So usually what you get is the name of the accused and the name of the prosecutor. And sometimes you have no idea the relationship of the prosecutor. So this is a, so I don't mean prosecutor in the modern legal sense. Um, this was a period of personal prosecution. So if you, if, if you wanted to charge someone with a crime, you're the one who had to pay to prosecute. So there was no Crown Prosecution Service. So the person who decided to bring charges forward would be listed as the, prose uh, the, the prosecutor. So you might get the name 
of the accused, you might get the name of a victim and you might get the name of the prosecutor, but that's unfortunately about it. So you have to physically engage with the records to find out the other details of these sort of incidental players in the cases. Right, I'm just going to do, I think, two more maybe. Uh, do the records discuss paternity and whether a man could be held responsible for care of a child he fathered out of marriage? Oh, that's an interesting question. You don't, um, because this is the highest criminal court, it's um, similar to the assizes, you only really see serious felonies in the jail files. So because bastardy wasn't, as it was called, I hate that word, but it's illegitimacy wasn't um, a serious crime. You only really see details of paternity coming up in relation to things like infanticide cases. Evidence of paternity you would find more so in the quarter sessions, which are held mostly in local records offices, um, or in things like bastardy bonds and uh, affiliation orders, which are also in parish collections in local archives offices, but we don't see that as much. We do see fathers being um, charged as accessories in infanticide cases, which suggests that they had no interest in supporting a child, but that's about the extent of it. Right. Is there enough information within the Crimes and Punishment database to fuel an undergraduate dissertation or is access to the library a requirement? Well, working in the library, I would say definitely access to the library, but... Uh... Um, <laughs> yes, um, I, do, I do think there is. And one of, the, um, one, of, one of the ways that it could be done is through a quantitative analysis. So looking at particular types of crimes and looking at the verdicts or the punishments. So that that's one potential way, but I think there are qualitative ways you could look at it as well. Um, it's a doctoral thesis, but um, when done at Cardiff University, which is accessible online by Kath Horler Underwood, um, it's about female criminality in Wales, shows how, so she used the database, but also went to the library and used records there as well, but it's a combination of the two. And I think that's an example of the sort of research that could be done just using um, the index, but I'd be happy if anyone would like to have conversations about this at all, I'm happy to I'm, I'm happy to email or tweet or chat about this outside of, of this too and advise on things like that. Brilliant. So this is I think this, this is the last question. So um, with no index, is it the question of just delving through the records to see them yep. rather than just searching for anything specific? Yeah, it's 100 percent serendipity. It's you, you know, pick a you may uh, historians in the past who have used these have usually selected them in terms of um, years. And so there is there is a calendar that was put together, and by that it's just a list. There's a calendar that was put together saying these are the the years. This is and this is the f the file number, but it's literally just that. There's no other detail. So it is absolutely a, like a, it's a treasure hunt. Well, it was a fantastic talk, and I think you can Thank see you. from the, the responses how you know how much people really enjoyed and got a lot out of it. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we hope to see you again very soon. Goodbye.